Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nikta Sarkar, and today we're going to be talking about the latest updates um, in the Fluent GUI or user interface uh, for the 2023 R1 version. And for today's agenda, what I'm going to do is I'm going to showcase some new features and updates, some tips and tricks for you to leverage um, these new features. Um, but what we will also do is uh, look at the Fluent Parametric Workflow updates towards the end of um, my uh, so-called demo. Now, let me preface by saying before I dive into the rest of the presentation is that in 2023 R1, there have been a lot of updates that have come out, not just for the user interface, but also for different physics, um, even on the Fluent meshing side. Uh, and not just Fluent, right? The entire CFD suite, the entire product portfolio. So if you guys are interested in, you know, having more KVA sessions that are focused on any particular application or topic that you would like to see, then let us know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, Christina to sort of launch a poll question. And that'll help you choose which topic you would like to see in uh, future sessions. And because it's not easy to combine all of them in one particular sitting, uh, I've broken it down into different topics. So you can choose the option that's um, most suitable for your needs. So you can see the poll on your screens right now. I'll give you guys a minute to answer. And even though, you know, I'm going to talk about the parametric workflow updates in today's session, uh, we could have uh, a more in-depth demo um, for a later session. And that will um, allow you to see how you can use Fluent for doing parametric study without relying on Workbench. So if, it's, if that's something that you're interested in, you can choose that as well. Okay, I think we should have the poll results by now, right, Christina? Excellent. All right. So we see that we have a lot of interest for meshing, GPU, high speed flows, and parametric workflow demo. So that's good. You know, we can break it up into different sessions and have uh, multiple KVAs curated accordingly. So we'll go ahead and keep your suggestions um, in our mind when we decide the topic for future KVAs. Okay. So without further delay, let's jump right in and talk about the newest features in the Fluent Solution mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use the Fluent GUI to show you and walk you through all the features and updates. I think that way, um, you know, a lot of this information would be retained better. But I'll keep the slides handy for myself. If you guys want a copy of these slides later on, um, then let us know uh, in the chat box, or you could reach out to us at supportedkativ.com. We'd be happy to share a PDF so that you have one consolidated document that lists all the changes, okay? So what I have on the screen right now is the 2023 R1 Fluent Launcher. Uh, now, right off the bat, you can see that the launcher looks different uh, than previous versions. Let me go ahead and do this. Um, you can see that now we have tab views. Uh, so by default, you open in the home tab. And what the home tab does is it contains all the frequently used options uh, for launching your Fluent session. Uh, this looks a lot cleaner than the versions in the past, but you could also access other options by going to the other tabs in a similar fashion. Um, so I'm going to stay in the home tab over here. By default, you know, you launch your session in the premium mode, but if you want to choose enterprise or pro, uh, you can do that from here. This feature has always been there, um, but I'd just like to reiterate for those um, who are perhaps new to Fluent. Um, now, you will also notice that earlier you used to have different options for reading the case file, data file, etc., but now you have one single field. You can click on the drop down menu and choose between uh, the different file formats that you might want to read into your Fluent session. Um, the working directory now encapsulates the entire address. So, you know, you don't have to actually click on it and look at the entire address. 
Uh, the other thing is there is this space for looking at recent files, right? If you click on a file over here, it gets highlighted in orange. And you will notice that once it is highlighted, you have another option over here, which says case file info. So if you click on it, what it's going to do is it's going to show you which version the original case file was saved in, okay, whether it was single or double precision, uh, whether it was 2D or 3D, and how many cell counts or how many um, faces did that particular mesh have. This information might be very handy if, say, for example, you're opening a very old file, you don't know if it's 2D or 3D, you don't know, you know, uh, which version it was saved in. So it helps you get a little bit more information about the case or the mesh that you're reading in even before you launch the session, okay? And the other thing is if you were to go to the enterprise mode, um, you could leverage the native GPU solver. I think we have done a KVA in the past on the GPU capabilities. Uh, so if you click on this guy over here, what it'll tell you is the kind of GPU that you have on your machine right now. So you can see, okay, what type of memory it has, how many streaming multiprocessors, because that would impact, um, you know, the compute capability of, um, you know, your GPU solve. Right. So I'm not going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and uh, deselect this and go back to premium mode. Um, but these were some of the um, more usable features uh, for the launcher window. So let me go ahead and start the Fluent session. I'm going to deselect this and read in a fresh case. And if you guys have any questions while I'm talking through this presentation, please feel free to leave it in the Q&A box that you see on your screen. We can take questions towards the end. Okay, so now you see um, the Fluent session open on the screen. Uh, the mesh and case info that I just showed you uh, by clicking on a recent file, that can also be accessed inside the GUI itself. So you would go to file, go to read, and then you would click on case or mesh info. And then I could go ahead and select on any particular mesh file or case file, and it would give me the same information in the console. This doesn't read in the file, this just gives you information about the file, okay? So let me go ahead and actually read in the file. Okay, so now that the case has been read in, um, let me show you guys a way to change the font size in the graphics window. This um, option was not available in previous versions, but sometimes I've heard complaints uh, from customers or other users that you know the font is too small on the graphics window and perhaps you're not able to gauge everything that's written, especially for demos, right? Because say, for example, I'm doing the KVA right now, if the font of the uh, panel was really small, sometimes it's hard to make out different things. So now what you can do is you could go to File, Preferences, go to Appearance, and then you have um, an application font size over here. So if you click on the field over here, the default size is 13. You will notice that the font in my Fluent session is a bit bigger. So say, for example, if I were to revert to default, it goes back to 13 and everything becomes smaller. But uh, let's take advantage of this feature in today's session and let's make it 17 because I think that um, looks a bit better, at least for the KVA sessions. And not only does it increase the font size, but even the symbols that are accompanying some of the features on the GUI, they get magnified a little as well. So you can see the difference um, in the appearance of the GUI. Okay. All right. Now, um, while we're talking about appearance, um, sometimes we've, you know, Ansys has received requests from customers saying that, how do we maximize the graphics window? So say, for example, I have an example case read in, nothing fancy, just a manifold. Um, you can see what it looks like over here. Actually, let me go ahead and uh, change the appearance. Uh, 
I don't want all these extra features. Okay. All right, so we have the case file read in over here. We are looking at the graphics. Uh, the question was, how do we maximize the graphics window? Now, obviously, we know that we can stack the outline view and the task page, right? So they get stacked here on the side. Uh, and that will give you a little bit more space to work with the graphics window, look at post-processing results, etc. But now there is another way to sort of only focus on the graphics window. So what you do is you go to arrange workspace over here, click on it, and there's an option called console. And if you click on in message window over here, uh, what it does is it completely takes away the console window and you're left with the graphics window on its own. So now if you're interacting with the graphics window, say for example, if you're running a simulation and you're looking at enhanced plots, that sort of stuff, or perhaps looking at an animation, and maybe you don't need the console at that very minute, you can use this method to hide it. Now, where did the console window go? It went to the message panel. So right at this um, bottom corner over here, if you click on this guy, there's a separate tab for console. OK, so you can keep this window open while your simulation is running so that you can keep seeing console messages if needed. But if not needed, you could also just go ahead and cross it out. And now you're just left with the graphics window. OK, so let me go ahead and switch back to the default view. Now, the other thing that has been introduced in 2023 R1 is better visibility for the imported profiles. So say, for example, I have um, three mass flow inlets in this problem and one pressure outlet. OK, let me, you know, just for the sake of example, go ahead and uh, apply a pressure profile at the inlets. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar, pressure profile basically means that the pressure values for each and every X, Y, Z coordinate for a 3D mesh that can be implemented at these surfaces. Right. So let me go ahead and change these three guys. Sometimes I just want to, you know, um, go ahead and um, uh, mute out myself so that I don't hear all these uh, sounds when I'm making um, choices and fluent. So we'll go ahead and copy it this way. Okay. All right. Now, say, for example, I want to apply a profile over here, right? So I could double click on the boundary conditions panel. It opens up in the task page. Let's go to profiles and let's go and read in a profile over here. Okay. So this is in the CSV format. There could be multiple formats. So we're reading in uh, a profile file for the pressure that we are going to um, uh, apply at the inlet boundaries. Now, uh, you will notice some changes to this dialog box, right? So now you have something called point cloud, okay? So what the point cloud does is it'll generate points all over the um, position of the profile uh, that you've just imported. So say, for example, if I go ahead and click this box, show point properties, and then hit preview, you can see in the graphics window that wherever the pressure was imported, those points get highlighted. OK, you could even increase the size. And, you know, this becomes a little bit more clear. Now, what if you wanted to overlay this point cloud over the mesh to see that the um, location of the profile matches the orientation of the mesh uh, exactly as you meant it? So that possibility is also there. So you could go ahead and uh, click on overlay a graphics object. But before that, let me actually create a graphics object. So I could just go ahead and click all the inlets. And so this is um, a graphics object named Mesh1. Okay. So now if I go back to the Profiles panel, um, I have something to choose in this drop-down menu. So I could simply click this box as well. And you can see both the boundary and the profile that was imported for that particular boundary 
uh, are visible at the same time. So we were able to superimpose them and you could check the settings um, in your problem that way. Okay. So this is a very useful and handy functionality. Uh, since we're talking about mesh, uh, another small addition um, that has been made to 2023R1 is you can um, vary the transparency or the opacity of your mesh objects right from the mesh display box. You don't have to actually go into the results and you know fiddle with scenes, et cetera, to vary the transparency. So I could go ahead and uh, make things transparent right in the mesh display box. So if you're looking at a lot of components, parts, this makes it a bit easier. Also, if you're generating path lines, um, having you know some transparency for the external walls will help you visualize the uh, path lines better. Okay. Now, um, this capability has been there for some versions, but you know there were some uh, new additions that were made in 2023. So we all know that you know we can go ahead and select a surface, and then use this quick context window to assign uh, a particular boundary condition. And if you click on more, then the actual dialog box opens up. Um, but what you can also do is you can go ahead and right click on any selected surface and now directly generate report definitions from the graphic window itself. You don't have to go to the outline view to do that. So say, for example, I wanted to create a surface report or a flux report on this particular surface, I could do that directly from the graphics window and it automatically gets added to the report definitions um, over here in the outline view, okay? And um, you will also notice that under report definitions, there's also mesh report. So if you were looking at any one particular zone or a boundary, you could look at the exact cells or the faces that were um, included in the selected zone. So that functionality has also been added. Now, the other thing that you can do, um, because we're on this uh, topic, is that you can create plane surfaces for the centroid of the selected surface in the graphics window. So. This is a very simple geometry that I'm showing you as an example, but if your geometry has a lot of components, a lot of parts, and you don't want to, you know, create a plane through the middle of the entire, um, you know, um, uh, the entire graphics window visible objects, you just want to, you know, create a plane through any one selected part for more focused post-processing, you could use this method to select that particular zone. And then you could right click on it, go to surfaces, click on a plane surface. Let me make this in the XYZ, XY plane. And you can see that this plane is cut through the centroid of the selected grid surface. So I can go ahead and create this. So if you click on this guy over here, so you can see how the plane is created. And this way your post-processing becomes a little bit easier. All right, okay. The other thing that you can do um, is um, create more accurate locations for point monitors. So say for example, um, you wanted to create a point monitor on the mesh and you wanted to select any one particular location on the wall for say, um, Let me reduce the transparency so that it is completely opaque. I want to choose a, surf, a, a point on the wall to monitor the temperature as the solution progresses, okay? Uh, I can turn on the mesh to tell me exactly where are the nodes and you know where are the cell centers. But in the past, when we would try to create the point monitor, even after choosing what we think is the right location, it wouldn't automatically snap to that node or cell center. So in 2023 R1, what they've done is they've added this capability for point surface so that you can snap that point monitor to the exact node or cell center. So for example, let me turn this off, right? So let me use the traditional way. I want to choose this node over here, okay? So I can use the mouse probe button, which is the right click, uh, right mouse button. And I can go ahead and select this guy. 
But as I zoom in, you will notice that it's not exactly coincident with my intended node, okay? So, but now what we can do is we can select snap on probe click, click the node option. And if I do this now, you will notice that the selection is exactly coincident with the node. So this is a handy feature, same thing for cell center. If I want to, you know, create a point monitor at the cell center, I could again go ahead and, you know, right click over here and it automatically snaps to the center of the uh, uh, cell that we are focusing on. Okay. So this is again, uh, a, you know, quick trip to uh, ease your post processing. Now, let me go ahead and run this simulation because I want to show you guys something on the residual front. But uh, before I do that, let me actually use the pressure profile we imported. So I never changed this thing to pressure inlet. That's why it doesn't show up in the drop down menu. Okay, so now all three of them have some pressure applied through the pressure profile that we imported. So I'm going to go ahead and run this simulation for a few iterations. Um, and I don't want to select any convergence criteria because I just want to make sure that the simulation keeps running. Okay. All right. So now we are running the simulation and we're looking at convergence through residuals and other monitors that we have set up. Um, and the simulation is running, right? So notice that all plots are now enhanced plots by default. You can hover over them to you know, look at the exact value of that particular residual um, at any particular iteration. These are not interpolated values, these are actual values. So say, for example, at iteration nine, the value of K was 60 minus three. So you can do that while the simulation is running. You can also go ahead and hide certain plots by clicking and uh, unclicking on the legend if you just wanna focus on any one particular plot. So, you know, you could have all of them together. And then um, let me not mess with the residuals, but say, for example, you're clicking, um, you're also monitoring some other data. You could do this for the scaled residuals as well, but I just didn't want to mess with it. But you can change the access properties on the fly while the simulation is running. So all you would do is double click on any one particular axis and say, for example, you want to make some changes. Let me make this dark green. So as you apply this, you can see that whatever changes you made to the axis, um, they get incorporated immediately while your simulation is still running. So this will help you sort of um, gauge the convergence better if you're looking at a lot of values, a lot of properties, um, and then you know, perhaps you can get some added information from using the enhanced plot likewise, okay? So let me go ahead and stop the simulation. The other thing um, that has been added is um, an ability to you know, enter multiple execute commands in the same box. So if you remember um, earlier when we would go to calculation activities and you know, click on execute commands, each command would have to be entered separately in one line. Right, So a new command goes into a new line. So what they've done in 2023 R1 is um, you could go ahead and add all your commands in this white space all together. They get executed one after another. And this dialog box looks a bit new because now you can see um, that these executions can be done repeatedly or at the very beginning or the end. So say, for example, you're trying to patch a cell register before 
your solution updates for each design point. So you would want that patching to happen before the simulation starts for each design point, right? So you could go ahead and enter the command over here. And then, you know, you could just say execute once at the first iteration, and it would automatically do that. So let us, you know, use an example. Say, for example, right now, we are at the 72nd iteration, right? So let me go ahead and do 74. So I want two commands to be executed, two text commands to be executed at the 74th, uh, before the 74th iteration, right? So let me go ahead and do something very simple. And you would also do this for macros, by the way. So you could, you know, just go ahead and uh, define a macro and then have multiple macros included in this white space. So what I've done is I'm saying that at the 74th iteration, I want you to write out a settings file and then I want you to read in that same settings file. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do okay. And then if I hit calculate, well, it sort of asked for the overwrite command. So I didn't, I forgot to add yes or no, but you can see at the 74th iteration, it wanted me to write out a sample file and because I already had one in the folder, it wanted me to, you know, uh, either hit OK or cancel. So I could have added one more parameter in that text command. But whatever commands you enter, multiple commands that can be executed uh, right when you want it to. If you're doing a transient analysis, then this command option will also have flow time and time step. So right now it only has iteration because it is a steady state flow. Okay, so um, that way is if you say, for example, want to change the boundary conditions uh, after some global time step, you could go ahead and do that as well. Uh, so very handy feature um, that can make your um, solve more efficient. Now, the other thing, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular portion, but now you can, you know, go ahead and create ISO surfaces and ISO clips. Uh, right after initialization, even if the variable for which you're creating the ISO surface or clip uh, doesn't really exist in the solution yet. So say, for example, I want an ISO surface where the temperature is 1000 Kelvin, but, you know, it doesn't exist in the solution yet anywhere in the domain, that ISO surface can still be created. Okay, so you don't need a convert solution um, to create that particular um, surface. And same goes for ISO clips. You can also select multiple surfaces uh, when creating an ISO clip um, all at the same time. So you don't need to, you know, select one surface and then create an ISO clip from it once and then repeat the process for other surface selections. You would have multiple selections at the same time and then create an ISO clip accordingly. Um, so a small um, feature update, but thought, you know, I would let you guys know. All right. Now we've made a lot of changes to the setting, right? And we have uh, added some boundary conditions. Um, say, for example, I forgot to change mass flow inlet two from a mass flow inlet to a pressure inlet. And I realized that later, right? So sometimes when you have a big case, you can make such mistakes. So a good way to overview or, you know, to review whatever, you know, settings you've assigned in your case is in the outline view, you could go to setup, right click on this guy and hit list modified settings. So what that does is it opens a separate tab in the graphics window. So you could click on this and um, immediately whatever settings or whatever changes or whatever boundary conditions, cell zone conditions you've assigned get displayed over here. So now I can see that all three of my inlets have the pressure profile read in. But if I wouldn't have changed this mass flow inlet to from a mass flow inlet to a pressure inlet, I would be immediately able to tell. The second column shows the default value and the this column shows the values that you have supplied, okay? Now say for example, you see this and you want to make a change. Say for example, if the second inlet 
should be at a different temperature. Maybe it should be at 800 Kelvin, right? So instead of going back to the outline view and then selecting it from here, you can double click in the modified setting summary itself. And it'll open the dialog box for you to go ahead and then change the temperature. So you don't have to keep going back and forth. You can make changes directly from these modified settings summary. So pretty neat for you know reviewing your case setup. All right. So let me go ahead and close this guy. Now I'm going to talk about creating volume surfaces. Okay. Uh, let me see. So somebody has asked, could you please show the content of the Excel file? Um, I'm assuming that they're talking about the profile that I read. So yes, I will definitely show you guys the content of the Excel file uh, in just a few minutes. So let me complete this demo and towards the end when I'm taking questions and answers, um, I will show you guys the profile that got written out. Actually, I did not create the Excel file myself. Um, I, for this purpose of this demo, what I did was I uh, let the simulation run for a few iterations and I wrote out a profile file in the CSV format and then I read back the same profile file uh, in again. So if you're ever confused about the syntax of creating a profile file, that is another trick that you can use. Just write it out, look how it is compiled, and then use that same syntax to feed it back in. Okay. All right, so I was talking about volume surfaces, right? So um, multiple ways of creating this, let us use a cell register for this particular example. So um, a lot of us use cell registers to create zones or mark off cells that meet a certain condition, right? So if I right click on this guy, hit new and select field variable, a lot of you guys might be using this for, you know, doing adaptive mesh refinement, or maybe you just want to patch uh, a particular section of your volumetric domain. So there are multiple ways of using cell registers. Uh, what they've done in 2023 is they've added this additional option of creating a volume surface. So say, for example, I have a static pressure range of as such. Um, this looks, um, you know, don't look at the uh, results as such. This is just an example problem. But say, for example, I want to create um, a volume surface out of the cells that meet my pressure range. Okay. So I could just go ahead and say cells inside range. And since the average is somewhere around here, let me do 36,000 and 38,000 pascal. Okay, I could go ahead and create a volume surface over here and then hit save and display. So what you see over here is um, a field variable volume surface that has now been created. And if you zoom in, you can see the cells exactly with the cell center. So you can see that some cells have been marked off that meet the condition that I supplied, okay? Now, this surface is available for post-processing, okay? So if you go to results and then expand surfaces, the field variable that I just created uh, is um, available here. So I could right-click on this and display, and it would show me which cells uh, are included uh, for this particular surface. This is also available in contours. So say, for example, you want to look at a particular, um, say, for example, the velocity in this region, right? So you could go ahead and um, highlight that as well. So whatever surface you created, it's available for post-processing. It's also available for expressions, by the way. So if you want to you know, use it um, for as a location for your named expressions, that uh, is available as well. So you can see this thing uh, can be used for expressions and post-processing. All right. The next thing that I wanna talk about is one of the uh, coolest changes, I think, or updates in 2023, 
which is realistic material rendering. So when I started my presentation and I was showing you guys some slides, let me bring it back on the screen over here. Uh, when I was showing you the slide over here, You could see that um, you know the liquid in the domain, say for example, in the mixing tank problem, looks very realistic, right? It looks water-like. Um, so that is a cool new feature in Fluent. You know, you can uh, assign realistic materials to both solid and fluid bodies, and that's what we are going to see how to do in your Fluent session right now. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, like go to something fancy like Insight. You can, you know, create all these. Uh, post-processing results inside the Fluent GUI itself. So say for example, um, here is the mesh, right? Okay, let me go ahead and show you this. So I have a, a solid wall over here, right? Um, and this has been assigned some default color, color based on the surface type. But if I select the surface in the graphics window and then right click on it, uh, I could choose color by, and then you could color it by the variable if you have some solution in your problem, um, or you could change the color. But now you could also choose from a list of materials. And this material list um, is, you know, is going to give you realistic uh, textures and colors depending on what you choose. So say, for example, I want to choose concrete. So you can see that, you know, the material changes accordingly. And this is not just available for solids. You can also do this for fluids. So under your cell zone condition, say, for example, I just go ahead and display the fluid zone. And if I want it to be water, I could select this guy and then um, color it by water over here. And you can see that, you know, the appearance changes. For this problem, maybe it's overkill. But if you're doing a multi-phase simulation, tracking interfaces, or creating surface volumes that I just showed you, volume surfaces like I just showed you, uh, for those type of cases wherein you're looking at mass fractions uh, for different phases, etc., you might want to separate the two phases with different material colors, right? Say, for example, if you have oil and water, you could have different uh, material rendering for the oil portion and different material rendering for the water portion. Um, so that way you can create some fancy contours, etc. Okay. Now uh, you can also create your own materials. So if you go to the view tab over here and select material editor, you can go ahead and say, for example, I want to create a new water. You could just hit copy and a new water is going to be created wherein you can have a different color. Okay. So now you can choose water one and then, you know, it's going to be slightly different from the original default version, right? You cannot change the material properties that are already in there. Meaning if you're looking to, you know, change the texture and color of water itself, Fluent will not allow you to do that, but you can copy it to create a new material um, that has customized settings. Okay. Now, uh, lastly, I want to talk about quickly um, the parametric workflow updates. Now, we won't have enough time in this particular session to cover a demo for parametric workflow, but I did see that some of you guys were interested in seeing how Fluent on its own can be used as a parametric tool without having to rely on Workbench. Um, so, you know, we'll plan a KVA session that is ex explicitly dedicated to the parametric workflow. We'll show you an example of how to carry out, um, you know, different design point simulations. Now in 2022 R2, um, the physics and solver input variations were already there. So it was fully developed in the previous version. Um, and you could do sequential updates in single shared or distributed memory sessions. Uh, what that means is one design point after one design point after one design point, right? So you do it in a sequence. 
Uh, but the concurrent design point updates, that was limited to a single shared memory machine, right? So you couldn't distribute it over a cluster, right? So in 2023, what we've done is we've added concurrent updates. So if you have a cluster, if you have, um, you know, uh, um, distributed memory, you could run multiple design points at the same time. So that capability is now available in 2023 R1. You could also use your HPC parametric licensing to make sure that, you know, this gets carried out simultaneously. So if you have a work group license that can be leveraged to do these concurrent simulations. Uh, the other very uh, convenient and uh, useful feature is that the reports that are generated from doing a parametric workflow, they have become highly uh, interactive. They have, um, you know, included comparisons of different design points for you to gauge by changing the input parameter, what was the effect on the output parameters, right? So whatever graphics objects, solution reports, et cetera, you have created uh, in your simulation, you can now compare them for the multiple design points that you've set up. And if you want to create a design of experiment, you can use OptiSlang uh, to automa automatically generate that DOE. Uh, you can do this within Fluent itself. You don't need to open OptiSlang or you don't need to step outside outside of Fluent, you would need to have OptiSlang installed on your machine and you would need a license for OptiSlang. But as long as you have it, um, you know, you have multiple methods of creating this DOE uh, that can be used for doing advanced level optimization. And then you can post-process, you know, this entire data set in OptiSlang, but that is still a beta feature that's going to be developed and I think released in a future version very soon. So even though I'm not doing a demo, I wanted to show you an example problem wherein we've used only Fluent um, as the parametric tool. We haven't used Workbench. And the problem is basically a mixing tank problem wherein you are varying the impeller speed. So this is your input parameter. And then the output parameter or rather the results that we're interested in is to understand the vortex shape as a function of RPM, right? So you can see that the vortex shape changes um, you know, as the speed increases. So we have a couple of output parameters set up. And uh, for each of these design points, we had to initially patch uh, a volume of the tank uh, as water or as the liquid, whatever it is you are mixing. So with the help of the execute command that I just showed you a few minutes ago, you could patch the uh, initial volume that is filled with a particular type of fluid uh, for each design point before it starts, okay? And so we did this entire simulation using the parametric workflow in Fluent, and we generated an HTML report. So let me show you the HTML report because that is also pretty cool. So, uh, let me see, is it over here? Yes. So we know that, you know, once you generate a report for any fluent case file, even if it doesn't have parametric report, it can be exported as a standalone HTML file. So even if somebody doesn't have fluent, they can just open the HTML file and go through the results, et cetera. Okay. So, um, I think we are already familiar with the table of contents, et cetera, whatever we decide to include in the result. But this is the design point table from the Fluent Parametric Workflow. So you can see that the input speed of the impeller um, that was chosen as design point one, two, three, four. And we have multiple output variables that um, are exported as the uh, output parameter once the simulation completes. So all this is good. I'm not gonna go over this, but let's look at the results, right? So if you are looking at standalone results for each and every design point, you can go ahead and do that. So you can see it tells you the same contour that you set up for the base problem, you know, the initializing case, okay? That contour is available for each and every design point you ran. Right. So you could go ahead and look at it separately, or you could go ahead and do a comparison. So, say for example, I want to compare design point one with design point three for the same contour. I can now do that. Um, and that 
is a part of the HTML report that is generated. So pretty neat, right? Because you know you don't have to sort of rely on um, exclusive post processing tools. You can do that inside Fluent itself. Uh, you don't have to rely on Workbench or anything of that sort. You can have all these design point case and data files saved if you want. Um, and so you can individually go and look at the results or go ahead and do a comparison of the different points. And so if you're trying to build out a design space, optimize your design, optimize your process, look at operating conditions, uh, definitely use this functionality uh, to make your work easier. Okay. So let us know in the comments if you would like to see how this simulation was done and set up using the parametric workflow. We could make a separate session out of it. All right, so going back to my PowerPoint, the other thing that we can do is use mesh morphing along with parametric workflow. So in the previous example for the mixing tank, we were just using RPM as an input parameter, right? But we were not making any geometry changes. Now, conventionally or traditionally, if you had to change a geometric parameter in your simulation, you would have to do it on the CAD side, then update the mesh, then you know, rerun the simulation if you were using you know, parametric studies using Workbench. But Fluent also provides you with the capability of morphing your mesh or making geometry changes inside Fluent without you having to go back to your geometry tools or without you having to go and set up a separate geometry parameter somewhere in the pre-processing stage, okay? So again, this is uh, another bioreactor example. As you can see from the graphic on the slide, uh, what we changed inside Fluent was the tank height. So that was the geometric parameter that we were changing. And we used the parametric workflow in the previous example, along with mesh morphing, to have multiple design point simulation results available for different tank heights. So you can see a little bit of an orange isosurface inside this tank. As the tank height increases, you can see this isosurface changing. So that is an example of the different results that you can review by including um, different geometric parameters. Again, you can generate an HTML report for this workflow as well that will help you do the comparison in a much easier fashion, okay? Um, if you guys are interested in learning how to do that, how to use mesh morphing, let us know. And, you know, we'll do a KVA, uh, you know, showing you an example on how to use mesh morphing along with the parametric workflow, okay? So that's all I had for today. Uh, if you guys have any questions uh, based on the content that I just showed you, uh, feel free to let me know in the Q&A box. And uh, I'll also go ahead and pull up the Excel sheet that somebody wanted to see. So this was the Excel sheet that was written out by Fluent when I um, exported the profile. So you can see X, Y, and Z coordinates and pressure values over here. So these X, Y, and Z coordinates are the coordinates for the inlet one, inlet two, and inlet three, because those were the locations from which um, I exported the profile file. So this gets automatically generated by Fluent. If you are creating a new profile file wherein you are inputting the values, you just need to know the coordinates. You just need to know the actual values of the variable that you are assigned. Okay. All right. So uh, is pseudo transient no longer available in Fluent 2023 for the pro license? So for the pro license, um, I think the transient capabilities were added just in 2023. So transient capabilities were not available for Pro before 2023. Uh, I would have to double check if the pseudo transient functionality is available or not, but I know for a fact that um, transient capabilities were added in just this version. Um, 
So I will have to actually double check by launching my Fluent session in the pro mode. I usually use premium. So off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure, but I can definitely get back to you, Ryan, uh, on this matter. Uh, would be happy to do that. Any other questions? All right. If you guys want a copy of all the slides, I mean, I did not share the slides because I was sharing the GUI session, but if you want, um, you know, the documentation for all the features that I listed, we can go ahead and share the PDF with you people. So just feel free to reach out to Kativ, uh, support at kativ.com. And we can, you know, provide you with the PDF so that you have all these features in one place. Okay. All right. Um, excellent. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, wish you guys a very good day ahead. And we'll meet next time for another Answers KPA. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Snigda. We will see you all at the next Kati Virtual Academy session.